Hello, everybody. Instructive Chess Classics continue today with a beautiful game between Paul Morphy and Louis Paulson that was played in the first American Chess Congress in 1857. This was the final match between these two strong players, but Murphy showed his class in this game. I love this game personally because we have this general understanding of Paul Murphy being a dynamical attacking player that he always sacrifices, goes for activity and wins. This game is different, folks, and shows us what a visionary Murphy was. His positional understanding was also one of a kind. This game features so many nice positional concepts. I want you to pay attention to how Murphy is burying the enemy pieces and how he treats his own pieces in a very nice way. Let's start. Folks, it's a nice Sicilian battle, by the way, for those Sicilian players, you will enjoy. Morphy with the white pieces, of course. Interesting, he goes for d4 on the second move. One expects Mora, perhaps, with Mora Gambit with c3, right? But Morphy now starts playing positionally again, right? So it actually transposes to one of those Paimanov slash Polsen slash Khan kind of structures. But in this case, Polsen which actually gave a name to one of the Sicilian variations, plays bishop c5 here, knight b3 hits the bishop, and bishop b6. Okay, so already now maybe you can have an understanding of one of the main problems in the black's position, namely the bishop on c8. For the entire game, folks, I want you to focus on that bishop on c8 because that's Morphe's game plan. He will bury and deactivate that piece for the entire game. Knight c3, knight e7, and already here comes Morphy's plan. Morphy is forming a plan here, folks. He looks at this backward pawn on d7, right? A potential target. And he looks at his bishop on c1. Putting this way, where would you place your bishop, folks? That's my first question to you. That's a developing move with the bishop, but what's the correct square? Yes, Morphy goes bishop f4, a classy positional move. The idea is to actually insert a bishop on d6, thus bury the bishop on c8. Look at the connection between this idea and the long-term restriction of the piece on c8. Morphe is showing us a class already with this move, folks. Well, castles is not the best move. Recently, or more modern treatment is d5, right? Because that's black's only chance to not to allow bishop d6 in this position, so black has to accept the isolated queen pawn like this that's an isolated queen pawn that's a long-term target for white obviously but at least right at least the bishop is alive <laughs> the bishop is alive and black should have played like this okay so Paulsen did not understand the long-term dangers he was facing and that's exactly why this game is in this episode because that's very instructive of what's going to happen in the entire game white to play folks what should white play Please be consistent with your last move. Yes, Paul Morphy plays bishop d6, folks. Look at the bishop on the square, a multi-purpose move. Not only pinning the knight, but actually just freezing the d7 pawn, thus making the bishop sad. Also look at this, right? The bishop on b6 is also stopping black from developing the bishop this way. You see? He's identifying the peace problems in the black's camp. <laughs> this is the whole game plan for white folks. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful game to follow. F5. Well, black needs to create something, right? So he tries to activate their pieces using the F file. But Murphy shuts down things, of course, with the move E5. That's another very instructive move. He's basically cementing the bishop on D6. Thus, he's freezing the bishop on C8. Again, right? There is a consistency in White's approach. You see a plan unfolding. Also, his king is in the center, so he wants to close the game for the moment, right? That's also the final point of this move. A6, well, there are some problems like this. Knight b5 and knight d6. So Paulsen spends one full tempo with the move a6. Black is already suffering. And here, of course, Morphy very quickly, right? Very quickly, he castles short. Now he safeguards his king, and now the entire game plan becomes obvious. White is playing against the bishop on c8 because if the bishop is buried, then this means this also, right? The rook on a8 is also buried. That's the beautiful part of this, folks. This understanding, positional understanding of peace restriction, right? 
that just gives us a very clear game plan, basically. Rook f7, unpinning the knights, right? And he'll morphe goes king h1. My question, what is white's idea? Why did white play king h1, folks? Yes, he wants to play f4 and support the pawn on e5 and create this beautiful formation in the center, which is burying the bishop on c8 box. Okay, so Paulsen wants to stop this with the move f4. f4 is played for two reasons. Maybe knight f5 is an idea, but also, right, he's stopping white from pushing f4. Paulsen was a very strong player. He Morphe is not playing as an amateur, unknown amateur here, folks. That's also why, what makes this game very special, right? How he outplays a strong player. Now, every pawn move in chess has a drawback. Can you tell me the drawback of this move f4, folks? Yes, you're a great player if you looked at this e4 square right now, right? This pawn was on f5, this pawn was controlling that square, but the moment you push f4, right, there is no control on this e4 square. What is the significance? What can white do to exploit it? Yes, Murphy plays knight e4, right? He's a great positional player. He basically finds that moment to activate his pieces. And now this knight is a beautiful piece in the center of the board. No black pawn can chase this piece away. It's literally an outpost on e4 because it will be impossible for black to chase that knight with the move d5, right? In this position, plus... The knight can even at some point, right, jump to that d6 spot and freeze the bishop on c8. Beautiful, beautiful play from Morphy. Knight f5. Well, understandably, he wants to hit the bishop. The problem is this. Well, if you take my bishop, I can replace it with a pawn or maybe with my knight and still bury your bishop on c8, right? So that's actually not going to even solve black's problems. Black should have played knight g6 here. That's the only source of counterplay because at least, right, they are hitting on the pawn on e5. But even in this position, white is a move like bishop h5, right, pinning that knight. Black needs to find this engine-like defense, basically, to have an okay position in this case. Even g3, it seems like white's pieces are very close to the king side. I want to open up my pieces, right? Takes, takes. And here, black can use tactics to win that pawn that's a disgusting engine line actually because the point is this right if you take my rook then after g takes that creates a counter attack on your knight even so even in this position right objectively white is better i mean look at your king right <laughs> like look at your pieces so for example there are moves like bishop g7 here folks right just look at this queen g4 and your king becomes naked and I will bring reinforcements to the king's side very, very soon. Even this position looks very ugly for black to play, right? So, going back to this position. Olsen chose knight f5 in the actual game box. And Morphy basically goes bishop h5 first. Putting a question mark to black's position. Well, g6. He's forcing g6 in this position. And this is creating, right, further weaknesses on the king's side. Murphy is a genius of creating targets and weaknesses around the opponent's king. And that's exactly why he first played bishop h5. Now the bishop drops back and puts some pressure on black's, let's say, most active piece. And here, Paul Sen goes wrong, knight g7. Well, he should have taken, he should have taken the bishop. The problem is this, right? White will replace the piece potentially with the pawn actually because right there was some pressure on the pawn on e5 but then i replace my bishop with the pawn and your problems remain right look at the bishop on c8 it will take such a long time for black to develop their queen side and that's already giving white a clear positional advantage despite the fact that the engine might give a small advantage to white it's just so easy to play with white in this position right for example to get the bishop out now black needs to bury the other bishop on a7 you see the problems that are faced by the black pieces here folks and even so right even so look at my pieces they are joining the action on the king's side right i have superiority on the king's side basically and look at your bishop and so on the problems remain for black basically but still Paulsen should have chosen this line of knight takes d6 because knight g7 is too passive and your pieces are still frozen in this case. Queen f3, Morphy just brings the queen to the action. h5 is another committal pawn move. That's a mistake because this pawn move creates another weakness on g6, which Morphy will later exploit. Okay, bishop h3. I thought the main idea was g5 here, folks, by the way, with the idea of g4. Well, 
does it work for black or is it too dangerous? That's my question to you. How would you judge this move g5? Because now g4 is coming and it seems like you're going to lose the piece on the next move. Should white be worried about this? The answer is no, because look at the black pieces, right? They are in Siberia and your king is so weak. So please, right? I make a move, for example, g3 to open up some lines on the king's side. And if you go ahead and push g4, thank you so much. I sacrificed my bishop for two pawns. And now look at your king, right? He became much more naked, basically. So it doesn't work like that. My attack is raging on that side. And after knight f6 check, there's a very funny line. Queen g6, right? Look at this. Knight is pinned. The queen is putting pressure. And black is completely frozen in this position. They cannot move a single piece, folks. Even the king has no square in this position to escape. You can never take my knight because after he takes f6, everything is collapsing for you. So that's a beautiful position to contemplate. And well, what is white planning to do? Probably this, right? Just this. Or this. Mate. <laughs> you think we mated in two moves in this position. So obviously after h5, black should not even dream of playing g5 and g4 given their king's position, right? So Paulsen played queen h4. That was the reason. It also looks like a strange move at first sight. But I guess one of the ideas is to play bishop d8 and cover some, you know, weaknesses on the king's side, basically. But the queen will be chased away on the king's side. First, Morphy starts a knight f6 check. And after king h8, he does go queen e4. And now we understand the point, right? Black's h5 pawn created a target on g6. And Morphy directly exploits that. This is the positional genius of Murphy. He's paying attention to the drawback principle, drawback of the opponent's last moves. And he's an expert, right, in taking advantage of that directly. Because the queen is an amazing piece right now and you can't allow this. So now the queen is to go in on the back foot, right, to defend some stuff. But then comes Murphy's next move, g3. Well, I want to basically open up lines on the king's side. I want to activate my rook on the f-file, right? So I actually invite you to take. And then after I recapture, my rook gets active on their file. Again, pawn play connecting to piece activity. Morphy was a genius to play with his pawns to activate and awaken his pieces. By the way, the bishop is still on c8 and the rook is still on a8, guys. Never forget about the basic imbalance in this position, right? That's Morphy's game plan, basically. So, Paul Sam plays f3. He tries to keep everything closed. The problem is after, yeah, fg3, fg3. I can also, by the way, go f4 in this position. But even this is fine because now look at my rook right bishop d8 and here white is an amazing move knight e8 tactics are working for white because now i'm hitting your rook on f7 right and after takes takes can you take my knight well you can but then you allow invasion on the eighth rank and look at my rook look at my pieces again right black is completely lost there is not a single check to give again never forget about those three pieces on the king on the queen side <laughs> the game is completely over in this case so after g3, Paulsen tried f3, but then comes Morphy's beautiful move, folks. Beautiful move. The worst place piece joins the action on the king's side, right? Because the queen is tied down in defending the pawn on g6. That's a beautiful move. That's a genius move because now I simply want to take on f3 and involve my knight on the king's side. And if you ever take my knight, then the game is over, as you can see here, right? Look at the king. You have no moves left. I will just mate you on the next move, which means you have to take my knight. The problem is this. After he takes f6, it's still collapsing for black. Black has no moves left, basically, right? Takes, takes. Queen g7 mate, basically. So, after knight e2, Paul sent tried bishop d8, just to be able to, you know, defend some squares with the bishop. The problem is knight f3 comes with tempo on the queen, and now your queen has to go to h6 to guard g6. And again, take a step back, guys, and please compare the white pieces with their black counterparts. It's a clear Murphy-esque position. Murphy was destroying his opponents in simply, right, by piece activity and coordination difference. He was a real genius, folks, even in positional chess. Rook g1, well, what does Murphy want? He wants to activate his rook with the move g4, right? <laughs> another, another move that is designed to activate his pieces because here, these two rooks are the worst place pieces for white. So Murphy never forgets about his worst place pieces. So he just basically goes g1, rook g1, and just forms this very simple plan of g4. For example, if black played b5 and try to finally get the bishop on the long diagonal, comes g4, and after this, you see the rook, right? <laughs> you see the rook join the action, basically. 
and black has no way to defend this position there's one very cute line here by the way folks after knight f5 here well knight g5 hits rook first after takes white is having beautiful pieces this knight is pinned right this knight is pinned on the rook and this knight must guard the square h4 correct so both of these knights cannot move in this position and there's one move that is beautiful for white in this position white to play and win this position and you're a great player folks if you found a beautiful move bishop b7 because the bishop can be captured by the both knights but it's not possible for black to capture the bishop anyways and now i'm just hitting your rook which is basically running short of squares right so white simply wins material and the game is over for example like this i take and if you ever take this then you love rook h4 right the queen is pinned what a beautiful tactic over there but tactics favor good positions right white created this beautiful harmony and tactics are working for him basically so in the actual game Paulson tried knight e8 in this position the problem is this now the problem is this yeah bishop f4 is coming the queen is hit and there are other moves that will follow for example knight g5s are in the air and still it's a very very disgusting position to play and also the problem is this right the queen is totally tied down in guarding g6 for example if queen h7 is position knight g5 is coming and the game is over and how else can you defend g6 it's impossible for black to defend g6 right queen f8 just queen g6 and the game is already over everything is collapsing on the king side so after bishop f4 paulsen tried one final trick he tried to create this counter attack on the white queen on e4 and here i want you to stop the video folks and please find a tactical solution for murphy that won material for white white to play and win it's your turn folks you're a great player if you found the entire line queen takes c6 right because i'm still hitting your queen i want to capture material first after queen takes f4 black can sacrifice the queen back what's your next move folks yes queen takes c8 zwischenschach and then you collect the queen on f4 that was the game continuation and morphy won a piece in this position and obtained a winning advantage going back to this moment folks queen takes c6 the problem is this right if you capture my queen i capture your queen and i'm have a piece anyways with white in this position so really after queen takes e6 there's nothing black can do they're losing material in this position by the way the bishop is still on c8 and the rook is still on a8 that's move 26 that says something right about this game yeah so that's the game continuation and that bishop which would could never move the entire game was captured by the white queen with check funny right so that's the game continuation and the game ended like this. Even here, right? Rook c1. Morphe wants to take over the file directly. Most of us mortals will be passive in this position. Hey, my pawns are attacked. I have to go in back foot and defend my stuff. No. Morphe refuses to defend passively. He wants to activate, right? Even this part is so instructive. This was White's worst place piece and he activates the worst place piece directly in this position. Rook takes f2. Now my rook joins the action directly. Knight g8. And now you see what's coming, right? Knight e5. Activity. Hitting g6. Hitting the rook. Full force activation. All of my pieces. Knight g6 check. Knight f8 check. Basically, white, if you just take a step back, ask yourself, what's the material count? It's a piece for the pawn. So let's look at the final phase of this game, folks. Knight d7 was Murphy's move. Taking a pawn, also isolating that pawn on e6. And after takes, right? Little tactics, of course. I can take your knight. And now the black king is still so unsafe. White still has great coordination between his pieces. And now comes the final phase of this game. Bishop takes e6. It's full extra piece for white. Obviously winning after rook e7. Well, you tell me, folks. You tell me here. Black resigned, by the way, after playing this move. You tell me the most direct finish for white it's white to play in this position and mate in four moves please stop the video and find that forced mate you're a great player if you came up with the move rook 8 g6 first king h7 what's your next move bishop g8 check of course we will finish everything with checks rook h6 check of course and after this rook takes h7 is mate on the board 
and what a crashing game by the great Paul Murphy. He played this game, guys, in 1857. I want you to just, you know, take a step back. Without the engine era, the guy had no database of human knowledge. He was just playing this game at that time by sheer talent and chess understanding, right? Very brief summary of this game. What did we learn, right? You always should conclude with the basic lessons, right? What was the basic element in this game, do you think, right? To my mind, it's this positional beauty of bishop f4 to d6 and isolate that bishop on c8, thus the rook on a8. That was Morphy's game plan. He was such a visionary, right? I created a chessable course about this. The art of burying pieces, folks. If you want to explore these concepts more, that's a beautiful concept. So aesthetically pleasing. Burying pieces. They have the buried bishop. If you want to explore more of these concepts, please check my chessable course, The Art of Burying Pieces. I find this game so beautiful as a strategic player myself. But he was a strategic genius too, right? That's that's the conclusion as well. He was not only like this, you know, brute force tactical petzer. Murphy was way ahead of his time also when it comes to positional understanding and feeling for the pieces. That's the bottom line. Look how he's playing with his pieces. He's looking at the drawback principle, right? He's activating the knight instantly. He never forgets about his worst place pieces. He always has a keen eye to activate and involve every single piece in the game, right? That's typical Murphy. Plus... What else did we learn from this game? Let's take a step back, right? What are the other lessons that we can take from this game? Again, drawback principle. He's looking at the drawback of the opponent's move. He's first tying everyone down like this, right? I hit a weakness, thus I tie down your queen. That's another very typical positional pattern, of course, right? It's usually a good thing to attack a target, so the enemy pieces must go back foot. And the moment the queen is paralyzed, look at this, right? Even g3 is designed to help his pieces, but this is also a beautiful moment, right? This is the final, maybe the big point of this, of this game. He's looking at his knight. He's no longer serving a great function on that square. He wants to involve it on the king's side, and he's using tactics, right, to make a great positional move, knight d2, because the knight cannot be captured because of this, and the entire thing is collapsing. Thus, the knight is joining the action by winning a pawn as well. And the final two instructive points about this game, folks, is how he's using concrete calculation to convert his positional advantage here, right? Beautiful five-ply calculation, you might say. That's the first ply, that's the second ply, that's the third ply, that's the fourth ply, and that's the fifth ply, right? Very forcing five-ply calculation, and he's winning a piece. But the final instructive point is the moment he's a piece up, he doesn't go passive, right? He still wants to activate every single piece. And many beginners and many amateur players would fail in converting an advantage like this. I've seen myself many times as a coach. Difficult thing in chess is to convert a winning advantage. Most of us mortals would go very passive in a position like this, perhaps, right? We would be, oh, what's going on? His rook gets active. But Murphy is not scared. He says, you know what? Take my pawns and you give me the file. This is the final point of this game again shows us what a visionary murphy was he was way ahead of his peers also yeah when it comes to this stage of the game that peace activity dominated his vision and his chess play folks i hope you loved this game that's one of my favorite uh, morphy games actually right unlike his game against duke unlike his crashing victories from the opening i love this game because that shows the true depth of murphy's chess understanding folks and i will catch you on the next episode in another instructive master game we are learning from instructive classics and we basically improve our positional understanding we learn from chess history that's also a great lesson and those classics games like this that shows us a clear plan right this bishop on seat was buried that was our clear plan that formed our game plan are easier to understand easier to follow but lessons are huge right we can take the great lessons from such instructive classics that are not like modern chaos because if you watch modern top players it's usually chaos and it's very difficult to extract those lessons as clean as those games folks so that's my mission in this series to find those games and present them to you so we learn together if you like this video please give me a like and subscribe that's very important for me to be able to produce similar content for this team, you should check my chessable course, The Art of Burying Pieces, to get better. And I will catch you on the next episode on the Instructive Chess Classics, folks.
，拜拜。